<laughs> Welcome to my world. Oh my gosh. A little chaotic this morning, but you can kind of see that I took down my makeshift greenhouse to open it up so that they could grow better and I could grow more like snap peas and more tomato plants and more cucumbers. Because it's kind of odd, you know, that I'm growing all these vegetables and plants on a porch. But God blessed me with having extra room on this huge porch that's like, gosh, this must be a, this square that I'm in, which you can only see part of. Well, I think it's like, hmm, it's upstairs to begin with. And then it's covered, you know, but you can still see out. And it's so, I don't know, I'd say that's probably seven, so I'd say probably 14 by 14 square. And then it's also going that way, another, oh, I'd say seven by 20 feet. <laughs> it's huge. In other words, it's a big porch. So I had a lot of space, you know, and have a lot of light. So I've been adapting that for plants and for, you know, enjoying it, you know, because, you know, it's not, you know, like some people might have houses and homes and yards and all those things. We have been having a porch, you know, and that's what God blessed us with. So after our last apartment, when they told us not to put anything up or to grow things, we now found ourselves blessed by God because he moved us out of there, you know, and brought us here where he said, go for it. <laughs> and that's like, okay. <laughs> and last year we grew, oh, I don't know, I think six tomato plants, you know, grew a lot of tomatoes off of them. And now I've got like six there, but I must have 12 more all over the place. You know, and then also we added, you know, cucumbers and things like that. And they're growing, you know, they're, they're maturing. And you know, it's kind of like you see that in life. You know, you have different things that you start off with and you try out and you see how they work. You know, ministries that I've been a part of or that I had the opportunity to be in some small way, you know, a chance to help in a little way. You know, I've been blessed to experience that and to put that into my my memory bank of things that I had experienced and the things that I saw, the things that I heard, the things that I handled with my own hands, the processes of life that have grown up into me to develop the fruit that's inside me. Kind of like what these plants do, you know, they, they take what soil they have, what containers they're in, and they usually will expand their roots till they can go as far as they can if they're in containers, they become root bound. You know, they, they expand as far out as they can. But if they're not in a container, they, they'll put their roots down as far as they can go, and then they'll stop. Because they'll only go as far as the water is there. They'll always stay wherever the water is, because they want to pull from the sustenance. They want to draw from the wells of salvation, so to speak. And that's kind of what all of us should be doing, is that we should be drawing from our local or our, I always like to say local yokel, you know, but anymore that's not <laughs> too much of a compliment, I guess, but from your local body of believers, from your church that you're a part of, you should be able to draw from them as well as to give to them part of your experiences as well as them to participate with you to give them of their experiences. I know for myself, I'm greatly challenged by how blessed I am to be going to a church that really is, I'm just frankly amazed, you know, I'm, I'm <coughs> blown away, so to speak. I'm sure that it's had its challenges, like, you know, growing stages. I'm sure that it's gone through its experiences of starting up and growing through development. I'm sure that it's had its divisions and strifes and, you know, things that have gone on. But you know, the blessing that I have is that going there, there's nothing for me to do, really. I mean, it's so beautiful in the sense of 
I almost feel guilty that I stopped its growth because I like small fellowships. It's a small fellowship. I like the right on word of God. It's right on word of God. I like good worship. It's good worship, you know. And any place else, it would probably be a mega church. <laughs> but where it's at, as it is the way it is, hey, you know, it's just right, you know. It's intimate. It's nice. And I enjoy it. I don't really know anybody there, and I, I probably won't know too many people because I live kind of far away from it, you know. And as much as I love it from afar, you know, I don't get to be intimate with it near because lots of times we, by basis of our own experiences, can bring sometimes either luggage or baggage or things that aren't necessary at the moment that somebody else is going through something. It's kind of like, do you always need to say something? You know, do you always feel like you're the one that's the most important? That you have a better word or you have a experience that you want to relate? You know, you hear that in talking a lot when you listen to people because often people will start a conversation and then continue on carrying the conversation until they are the conversation. And God doesn't really want that from us. He wants us to develop our ability to listen, our ability to hear. The Spirit of God tells us that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And oftentimes I find myself more regulated and more relegated to being on the internet side of ministry as opposed to the personal side of ministry because I have been that type of listener where I just sat and listened and you know did behind the scenes more work than I would do in front of the scenes you know and that was wonderful you know and I enjoyed that but often there are those that need to be in the front of the scene so that they feel that reward of their esteem that God esteems them already worthy of dying for them but they also need to receive sometimes the reciprocity of people admiring in some small way for their self-esteem in the community of believers and I kind of notice that every now and then with some people you know it's like they they really need to do something so sometimes you may not be the one that should step forward to do something but you allow for the Holy Spirit to lead you in the way that you should go I know for myself my hands are full you know I, I look at this right now this garden that I do and man there's a lot of work here <laughs> I mean just watering takes some time and you know I still have to kind of string up some more string you know and kind of move some plants around because the sun's gonna turn into a hundred degree weather you know I look at Vidivo and I'm still working on that you know I've been working on it for years you know and I look at some of the people that you know have been touched by you know some of the ministry that's going on and some of, sometimes I look at the numbers once in a while you know to see how many people there are if it's really the Lord doing it or if I'm just ministering to one person you know and I'm always amazed that you know there are actually people that really you know are, are involved you know with this what we're doing sharing you know and relating Jesus and you know then I have to talk to Jesus and I have to sit down and say well Lord what do you want for me you know and I have to really sometimes give credit where credit is due to God because I too like you have sometimes a lack of inner self-esteem I feel like I want to do more or be more or accomplish more or I feel like you know somehow you know you want to you want to put on your best suit you know your best foot forward when God already loves you God's already taking care of you God's already said hey you're gonna make it it's okay relax enjoy it and sometimes you know you get carried away you know you get caught up into the world in its ways in some Christendom ways that in Christianity sometimes people get overboard on wanting to do more be more say more accomplish more and that's all good and dandy when there's a need and when God tells you to but if God hasn't told you to do something don't do it don't jump in where God doesn't want you to begin don't dive in where God doesn't want you to go. Be where and what God has chosen you to be, and you'll find satisfaction in what you do each day. We used to say in the Jesus movement, you know, you 
have a peace about it. You stay under the spout where the blessings come out. You enjoy what God has given you, then you employ that grace that He's given you. You know, in other words, what you've been given, you give out. What you receive, you give back. What you are a part of, you share of. You know, and it's like if you've received grace, you give grace. If you've been loved, you give love. We used to say also another way of looking at it was that what you want, you give. You know, if you want to be loved, give love. If you want to be in charge, you know, be a servant. If you want to, you know, I mean, it's always the opposite. You know, do do whatever it is that you want, and you'll find by giving it to others, you'll get. God isn't really kind of like a big bad wolf, you know, in disguise, you know, waiting to huff and puff and blow your house down. No, the truth is, you know, he's he's a father, and. Though you may go through times, you know, of you don't understand what's happening, you know, like these plants, you know, I've, I've moved them from one setting to another, and I moved them from another setting to another to get to the best place for them to grow. God has that in store for you. He wants to move you at times from one place to another so that you'll move into the best environment for you to grow as a person to grow as a believer, to grow in the knowledge of his son, most especially, but also to grow beyond that. Now, can you imagine that, going beyond the knowledge of his son? He wants you to know himself. He wants you to begin to develop a personal relationship with God the Father. Yeah, really. The Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. And to be able to, believe it or not, know each one separately as well as in unity. And that's kind of weird, but that's where we go with growing in the stature and the maturity of Jesus, of Christ. And we no longer say Christ, or we say God, or we say, but we say Father, or we say Jesus, or we say Spirit of God. You know, we begin to get that intimacy of relationship. We no longer worry about things that other people are consumed with or concerned about. But we're able to give to them an assurance based upon our experiences of life that we've gone through with God. And we've said, hey, I get it. You know, I, I, I know where you're at. You know, you'll be okay. You know, and you just have that confidence that you can give to them the hope for the reason that lies within you of that assurance that you have in faith that God is going to take them where he wants them to be. And that's what we do most assuredly in Vidivo. It's not always about the perfect. Because the perfect have perfection. It's not always about those that, you know, are already ministers or already teachers. Because teachers teach and they learn their learning curve from teaching. Sometimes teachers don't teach the best material there is out there. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they go beyond their abilities by way of the Holy Spirit inspiring them beyond the capabilities that they have within themselves to reason, to rationalize, to think, to perform, to function, to preach, to teach, to give that out with which they've studied for. You know, we're not always about that at Vidivo. You know, we like to say, if it's just for the one, you know, the one hurting one, you know, the one sinner, the one saint that doesn't feel like they're a saint, the one person who feels insecure, then if in some way I can help you to recognize that Jesus is with you in a personal and intimate way, he is standing next to you, he will speak to you, he will open your ears and you will hear audibly as well as physically, as well as if you need it, visually, God to reveal himself, if you need that. Because God isn't a bad guy. He isn't someone who's going to deny you all that he's given and all that he's done for you. In reality, he's going to cause you to recognize he loves you in one way, shape, or another. And when we do videos, that's the purpose of our design of why we go over this whole idea of hearing God speak. Because once you've heard God speak, you know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, they will not follow the voice of another. I have no problem with you having a personal relationship with God and going out and doing your own thing from that moment on because you're dealing with God. Now, you may ask me, you know, and I may answer you know, according to either opinion or what God has told me, but the reality of your personal relationship needs to be established to the point where you, you, not me and you, not this church and you, not 
you know, the pastor and you, not the elders and you, but you, one-on-one, -on -one, deal with God. And then you add to it all these other things. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things would be added unto you. It's not just like seeking first the kingdom of God, meaning that, oh, I'm going to go out and seek to build a church. I'm going to go out and seek to start a religion. I'm going to go out and seek to do as much as it is to be. You see, that's the difference between Christianity isn't just doing, although that's a part of it. Faith without works is dead. We know that. You know, It's by grace you are saved, and that not of yourselves, and that you... Jesus died so that we would have that grace extended to us, that we could begin to do the works of grace, do the works of love, do the works of mercy, meaning that we receive them and give them. Because after all, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So grace is given to us that we would extend grace. Love is given to us that we would love. And that's what the works are. They're not works like you think of building a church or starting a Bible study or all those other things. Those are manifestations of works that are inside you. The works that are inside is the love. The works that are inside that come out demonstrate themselves by the love chooses to use a Bible study to demonstrate love. In other words, that work of God and works of faith is always from the inside out, not from the outside working in. And that's how the Spirit of God works with the world today. He chooses to use you. And he chooses to use me to encourage each other to have the one-on-one -on -one first. Talk to God. Be with God. Have a relationship with him. And then as your relationship grows, share what you know. Don't share what you don't know. Begin to experiment, so to speak, with knowing God in a more intimate way. Begin to look at the scriptures in a different light and say, Hey, is this real? Am I real with God? Is God real with me? And then walk forward in that and discover, yes, you're dealing with a living God. You're dealing with the reality of eternity getting ready to expose itself or to crash in on your temporary idea of what life is. Because life is not what you see around you. This is all passing away and the lust thereof and everything you see is going to be consumed. It'll all burn. It'll be dissolved, as it were. And there will be an eternity that you will live inside of. And whether you choose today to understand that, or whether you figure that out tomorrow, the reality of God is going to intervene in the universe, and He's going to make Himself known. Some people will fear that day. Some people will be blessed by that day. Some people will just look up and rejoice in knowing their Father in heaven. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. A just God and a Savior. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. God was in Jesus reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Notice that the forbearance of God. God forbears his judgment giving opportunity and long-suffering time for you to get your act together, for you to get your life together, so to speak. And the way that we get our life together is we acknowledge God's taking care of our righteousness. He's taking care of our sin. He made Jesus to be sin for us, to be the propitiation, to be the, to be the acceptable thing that God wants from us. In other words, that's what propitiation really is. It's to take the place of, to substitute in a matter of speaking that with which we are not able to fulfill because we would only be a partial, we would be substitutionary, but we would not be propitiatory. In other words, we would not be the fulfillment of that which is required. Anytime that you have a fulfillment in a contract, it's like done, solved, everything was accomplished. But if you cheated along the way, 
Say you were a construction worker and you only used sloppy materials. Sooner or later down the road it would show, and then that contract would be null and void. But because it's a propitiation, it's complete fulfillment. It's a complete satisfaction of the requirements that are there. And that's what Jesus is, the satisfaction of God manifest in his life. For you, because when God wanted something from you, he looked at his son and said, hey, they can't do it. Can you? And Jesus said, yeah, I'll do it. So he did. And he became sin for us. And so the forbearance of God was that he would justify you. He would be the justifier of you. You can't make yourself just. And you can't find yourself justified. Only God can do that for you. And he's done that. And that's why he is called the justifier of those that have accepted the forbearance of God, that have accepted the long suffering, that have allowed for God to offer for ourselves the propitiation of his death of his son in that it was the redemption of our lives to him that was purchased from the sin we committed in the form of Adam sinning in the very beginning. You say, well, what fairness or what justification can there be in one man dying and one man living and one man causing sin and I didn't do it so you know why am I guilty? Well, you're not anymore if you accept what God has done for you. And you can argue with God about the process, but that's why it works out. You see, it's never been unfair that one man sin entered into the world. It's never been unfair that justification came into the world or redemption or that propitiation or salvation through one man. It's a just balance. It's a scale that God has said, done. And he's proven that he's willing to do it for you. So there's no unjustness with God. There's balanced scales. It's always even. He balances the scales. But the reason why is the interesting part. And the reason is, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So you see, God justifies us because of faith. Not some weird kind of like, you know, I believe, you know, but the faith in what God has done for us. God says, I will account to you just Abraham, because he believed, was accounted to him for righteousness. It wasn't because he was righteous. He still had to do what he had to do. He had to go through the trials and the challenges where he had to, oh my God, you know, I'm going to offer up my son. Okay, God, you said so. And on the downward stroke, stops. Stop it. And at the voice, God stopped Abraham from killing his son and imputed to him for righteousness because he said, I know now that you will not withhold anything but that you love me. And that's the one thing that we have in our life to demonstrate. We will be challenged at times, even as Christians, knowing that we're fully justified, knowing that we're fully sanctified, knowing that we're set apart for a purpose and a design that God has for us. Are we willing to, in our love, demonstrate our love for Him by choosing to obey or choosing to go our own way? For some people, they may arrive in heaven anyways. Because God is a justifier and God is a condemner. God can justify us and God can condemn us just as easily as he chooses to justify us. Because, quite frankly, I have no idea who has that appropriation or, or propitiation for sin. Because if it's God that justifies, it's also God that condemns. So. One of the things we're told is to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, not because we're supposed to be afraid, but because we're dealing with a holy God. You can't fake it to make it. In other words, you can't fake your salvation. You can't assume that you automatically are there without really going there. And how you go there is just believe. You just accept, believe, and go forward. And sooner or later, just like we've been talking about in video, sooner or later, things are going to begin to happen that you'll know it's God. It may be circumstantial to begin with. It may be corporeal, meaning that a lot of events around you seem to fit what's being taught you, you know, in the Word. But slowly but surely, you need to develop that personal relationship, gradually growing in discipleship, so to speak, of knowing who God is, knowing what God is, knowing how God is, 
knowing the Son of God, knowing that you can have assurance of salvation, knowing that you can have personal relationship, knowing that you can be forgiven for all your sins and trespasses, and knowing why you are forgiven. Because it's not according to works of righteousness which you've done, but according to His mercy, He saves us. So you see, there are times when, really, as much as this all looks like a mess, God will take it, rearrange it, and make it to grow for what's best for the person, to come into a personal relationship, and to eventually, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but these little guys, they're going to bear fruit. And you know what? The same thing's true with you. Your world may get turned upside down. Probably will. Mine has. Some people don't. i got to admit, this little church I'm in, you know, it's like some people just gone right through and I'm like, wow, I like that. You know, it's kind of neat to see people that are just smooth sailing. You know, and they've got, you know, they probably had rough times too, you know, rough waters and, you know, safe harbors, but praise the Lord, you know, God does do that with people at times, you know, he keeps them in containers and keeps them in safe containers and safe environments and grows them up into what he wants them to be. But if you're like me, and that's what video goes for, you know, you may have gone through some pretty rough waters, you know, and you may have some pretty, you know, serious scars inside. But you know, if God could take me and make me into an example of His grace, there is no doubt in my mind, as well as my experience, that God is going to finish the work He began in you unto the completeness of the maturity of the man of God, that, or woman of God, that He might have made you to be. And He's making you to be, even though you can't see it yet, because he moved you from one container to another container or took down your greenhouse and now you're exposed to the elements. Life's like that. Benny Hester used to sing, he's going to squeeze you and that's because he loves you. You'll know him better for the things he's brought you through, but he will squeeze you. <laughs> Be assured of that. And that's because, like he said, he loves you.